Welcome to the Goalie Hacks podcast, the show dedicated to providing elite tips, hacks, and strategies to take your game to the next level, where we help you become an elite goaltender, one hack at a time. And now, here's your host, Mike Santaguida. Bang, bang. What is up, guys? And welcome to the show. Welcome to episode six, interview number five of the show. Pretty sure last episode I said it was show number four when really it was episode number five, interview number four. But who's counting, right? (laughs) I hope everyone is staying safe and, and I hope you're all doing fine in these tough times. I hope you're all enjoying the show and I hope that this content and my guests and I can help you through these tough times as best as possible, you know, just by just filling some of that empty time, you know, you guys have and and hopefully you guys are are realizing it's just next level insight from the most elite goalies and and coaches in the world. Um, As always, if you guys need any help at all, if you haven't seen my Instagram page, go check me out, hit me up. Let's let's chat, say hi or whatever. Always love connecting with the community and helping as much as I can. Today's Dr. Zykowski and I, um, just had a next level conversation. He's literally the father of sports psychology in North America. And I couldn't be more honored to have him on today. This guy has worked with literally the most elite athletes of our lifetime. Like he works currently with the, the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Golden State Warriors. So definitely pay attention to the detail we go into in this one. Just quick shout out to the people, you know, that support this show, my work. Love you guys. IQ Goalie E-Digest, you know, I'm personally an annual subscriber of the product. And if you're looking to join many pro goalies and coaches around the world in learning about sports science related to goaltending that can be easily downloaded to your phone, this is 100% for you. So for just a few bucks a month, the E-Digest contains five easy-to-read articles. You know, they report on uh, and review sports science concepts related to goaltending and how to use them to your advantage. So today we're offering a promotion of 20% off if you use the code HACKS, in all caps, H-A-C-K-S, at checkout. Visit IQGoalie.com or find them on Instagram at IQ underscore Goalie for more details. Shout out to our other sponsor, NeuroTracker. And if you guys haven't heard of NeuroTracker yet, we have a discount for the community members only here that will that will only be running for two more weeks, you know. In my opinion, it's the best bang for your buck when it when it comes to how much it costs versus the results you're getting in return while being locked inside right now. Like if if you want to stay sharp while you're stuck inside, there's literally nothing better. So to kick off our sponsorship, we're giving away two subscriptions. Um, so stick around to the end of the show to get the details on how to enter. But just so you guys know, I have a discount today on the software that will only be available for two more weeks. So if you're looking to support the show and get better in these hard times, whether you're a coach or goalie, you know, if you're looking to save some money, just hit me up on my DMs on Instagram after you listen to the show to get more information on how you can get started today. Lastly, shout out to my supporters over on Patreon. And if you guys are looking to support the show and the work I do, if you're looking to become a part of my inner circle and get some extra perks, well, for just a few bucks a month, you can get things like a shout out on the podcast. Um, exclusive access to a private chat room I just started where I hang out with other goaltenders. We chat all day. I, I provide YouTube live stream links, private links nobody else gets. Inside access to my life, tips, hacks, strategies, all the things I'm working on, weekly updates. You guys are a part of my inner circle. Um, you know, I'm also working with goaltenders one on one to help take them to the next level. I'm already working with one kid and he's getting tons of results. Um, and if you're someone maybe looking to make that jump and increase your odds, I think this is definitely for you. So head over to my page at patreon.com slash goalie hacks for more details or message me on Instagram directly for more information. Without further ado, let's get into this week's episode of the show. I know you guys are going to love the chat Doc and I had today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Goalie Hacks podcast. I'm incredibly excited today to be joined by Dr. Leonard Zykowski, a professor, researcher, and consultant who's pioneered sports psychology by bringing cognitive neuroscience and sports performance together as an interdisciplinary science. Dr. Zykowski is a widely known sport and performance scientist whose specialty is the psychophysiology of human performance. For 37 years, he was a professor at Boston University with a joint appointment in the School of Education and School of Medicine until his retirement. 
From 2010 to 2012, he was director of sports science for the Vancouver Canucks of the NHL, where he introduced a comprehensive sports science program to the club. He has consulted with teams in the NBA, NHL, NFL, MLB, Australian Rules Football, the Spanish men's national soccer team, and Olympic sports organizations around the world. Len is a former president and fellow of the Association for Applied Sports Psychology, a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Applied Sports Psychology, and currently section editor on psychology for the International Journal of Health, Sport, and Science. Recently, the American Psychological Association honored Len with the Distinguished Service to the Profession Award. Currently, Len is a sports science consultant for a number of sport medical, military, and business organizations, and is a co-founder and senior consultant at 80% Mental Consulting, advising coaches, teams, and sports organizations on developing athlete cognition. After too many Boston winners, he and his wife now live in Fort Myers, Florida. Doc, how you doing, buddy? Thanks for coming on the show. Well, my pleasure. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, it's going to be fun. Yeah, I know. It's for sure. It's, it's nice to meet you. Uh, shout out to the guys over at, at NeuroTracker for for uh, putting me and Len in touch. Um, you know, it was really crazy when they mentioned your name. And and I had for months after talking with them, I really wanted to to get into a session and talk because, you know, it's so crazy for me right now. Like you're literally one of the fathers of sports science and sports psychology. It's so crazy. So for people listening, Len is currently working and consulting with the um, the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Golden State Warriors to to give you guys sort of a magnitude of the work he does. So pretty crazy. How long have you been working with them for? Just this season, yeah. They kind of, um, in both organizations, they're, you know, uh, Mike Sullivan, the head coach of the Penguins, was my student at Boston University. And he wrote a wonderful uh, introduction uh, uh, to the Playmakers Advantage, a book I published about a year ago. And but we've stayed in touch since he was a student at, at BU and then I was many years in the NHL as a player and as a coach. And we just reconnected. He wanted me to come in and kind of uh, uh, share some of my thinking uh, outside the box kind of stuff. Uh, not, not, not traditional sports psychology, but uh, more leadership and, and uh, kind of brain science and uh, how can we make everybody a little bit better from coaching staff to yeah. sports science staff to all the players. Yeah, no, very cool. And that's, I want to honestly dive right in. I don't want to waste any more time. Um, just because like you said, it's, it's sort of, uh, the things you talk about in your book and a lot of your work are, are, uh, is very effective and it's, it's not very traditional. So a lot of gray areas I want to dive into. Um, and, and you and I had an awesome pre-interview call and I want to dive into some of those things dis uh, we discussed. So Maybe you can just start off by by telling my audience, you know, obviously I gave you a big intro, but your your brief story on how you got to where you are today and um, the road to writing your book. Well, it is a long journey, you know. I've been in this business for a long time. <laughs> uh, you know, I grew up in uh, in northern Alberta. I went to the University of Alberta. My mission in life was to be a, a good teacher and a coach, and I thought it would be the greatest job in the world. And after graduating. Uh, with some wonderful mentors at the University of Alberta, I got a job teaching high school in a town called Stetler in the middle of the province, which is a sport crazy town. Right. And an opportunity to coach some midget hockey players where five of those guys made a journey to the NHL for brief to wow. a long period of time. It was an amazing journey, but, but I wanted to, be, and then I was still playing pretty good level of baseball and hockey and was coaching it myself. And I just wanted to be a better coach, Mike. And, uh, uh, one of the things we didn't learn at the University of Alberta, because it wasn't in at that time, anything on psychology. Mm -hmm. It was mostly physiology and biomechanics. And uh, so uh, I decided to go to the U.S. to get a, a, a degree and learn more about psychology. So I went to the University of Oklahoma, where they paid me to go to school and got my master's degree. And, and uh, uh, one of the professors said, you've got to... Uh, a real good sense for this science stuff. Why don't you go get a PhD? And my response was, uh, so what's a PhD? And, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, then we, he helped me set up at the, uh, in an interdisciplinary program at the University of Toledo, which would allowed me to get into psychology, education, and, and sport. And, uh, and more importantly, I, I, I decided to get into understanding the brain and spent a year at the medical school studying the brain and the nervous system of human body mm -hmm. and uh, 
Gould and I didn't know that that would pay dividends so many years later. But yeah. uh, of course, once you do that, Mike, you, 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 you like Yogi Berra says, you come to the uh, to the fork in the road and you take it. And uh, it, it's uh, uh, I couldn't go back into high school teaching and coaching. You know, they were looking for PhD hockey coaches or yeah, no kidding, <laughs> baseball managers. So it was academia. Here it comes. And uh, there was a one year job at Boston University. Uh, when I took it, uh, my wife got her PhD too. So we thought Boston was a great area for perhaps two of us to work in higher ed. And that mm-hmm. worked out really well. Uh, but uh, the most important thing, I couldn't have had a better uh, venue for for doing what I was doing. And I, nobody yeah, was doing it sure. at the time. And it was a, Boston's a great sports city, great academic center. So I had a terrific run that I never I wouldn't trade for anything. Mm-hmm. For sure. So that was the journey uh, into uh, kind of where I'm, how I got to Boston U. And then the other great thing that the university allowed me to do is to uh, do consulting. Uh, they felt that it brought visibility to the university. It it uh, uh, it uh, kind of strengthened my skill set as well. And uh, working with the Boston University Terriers, uh, not just the hockey team, but all of their sports teams. And training graduate students, I started a sports psychology graduate training program, one of the first in in North America, and uh, right up through the through the doctoral level, and uh, that continued until I retired in, in 2010. But again, I did consult worldwide, and as you mentioned in the intro, mm-hmm. uh, many sporting organizations. And at that time, I was consulting with the Vancouver Canucks, uh, uh, mostly in player development. And then they asked if I would come on full time. And I thought this was kind of a, a great time to segue away from academic work and mm-hmm. give something back to the sporting world. And I did that for three years till the NHL went on strike. And then uh, I went back to New England, got too cold, moved down to Florida. And, and But I just haven't stopped. I you know, got into writing the Playmakers Advantage book. And then uh, people find out where you're at. And they track you down. And... Uh, you can see can you know keep the consulting business going and and also involved in uh, uh, startup two startup companies and uh, uh, science advisor to them and so this is it's just kind of a more of a hobby but it's mm-hmm. it's it, it's turned into more than that yeah. so that's kind of my journey in, in a nutshell Mike yeah 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 no what what was sort of your role with um, Vancouver like when you first came in and sort of started working with the players like you said what was what was some of the the interactions, like how were you interacting with them? What were you teaching them exactly? Well, you remember, thanks, a great question, Mike. I think this is back to 2010. Mm-hmm. And think of the pro sports besides the National Hockey League, all through in North America and the NFL and NBA and Major League Baseball. Nobody had ever hired a, what we'd call today a sports scientist. Now, mm-hmm. now almost all of them had got somebody. So here I was not coming in as an MD or a, or a physiologist, but rather as a psychologist. Mm-hmm. And uh, my job was kind of more than just the psychology. I wanted to ensure that all of the other sub-disciplines from athletic training to strength and conditioning, or physiology of training, were using state-of-the-art uh, science, methodology, uh, uh, and, and I wanted to bring in kind of, uh, in fact, I started what we called the mind gym, mm-hmm. more uh, using biofeedback to teach self-regulation skills. So it, it, so what was kind of strange about that and funny actually mm-hmm. is that organizations from all over the world really came to see what the hell I was doing mm-hmm. in Vancouver. Uh, so it was kind of the first entry into this science, although uh, European, particular English premier, premier leagues were using it, had established it, but it, it's, it's really taken traction here in North America with sports science being an integral part of most professional sport organizations. Mm-hmm. So, it, so it was beyond psychology. It was a lot of other stuff, mm-hmm. a lot of player development work, kind of talent identification is something I take a lot of pride in, kind of my ability to help organizations identify uh, talent in a multidisciplinary mm-hmm. way. So it was a pretty global uh, uh, venture into uh, high-performance sport. And, uh, uh, you know, I felt I made big contributions, but also I learned a heck of a lot myself. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. How did people sort of view your work? 
I mean, back in the sort of the 80s when you first um, ended up at BU and then sort of every decade going along, did you sort of see that shift? Like people were starting to realize that there was something there that you were doing? Yeah, it was, it was a new d- d- discipline, uh, uh, always skepticism. And, you know, that skepticism continues to, to, to this day in many ways. Yeah, for uh, sure. You know, because many coaches feel this is a role that they're – it's their primary responsibility to deal with kind of the, the mental aspects of the game with their players, re- reluctant to relinquish that authority. Uh, so, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a constant uphill battle. And I know when you're trying to introduce new concept, for example, in Vancouver, I think we started the very first uh, sleep education program where we monitor the sleep of the Canucks players. And that quickly was like, came like a virus that spread to uh, you know, Seattle Seahawks the next year. And that's kind of global where most pro sports teams now, particularly those that have strong travel schedules, have a strong sleep education program, sleep monitoring program. But we started that in Vancouver back in 2009, 10. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I, uh, on a previous episode, I had another guest on IQ Goalie and we, we talked about, and, and in his research, he it, a lot of stuff comes up that sleep is, uh, to him, it was sort of a hack, uh, a goalie that gets good sleep versus a goalie that doesn't, to, you know, the data sort of, um, it's crazy, right? So uh, it's interesting that um, the NHL is always sort of first to the plate with these things, I guess, but um, now it's sort of, it, it was something I clued into from a younger age too. I always took a nap when I was like young and sure. even into my older age now, if I don't sort of get that good sleep, um, you know, I just, I could tell my mental clarity and, and focus and everything when I play is totally lacking. So that's, that's really cool. Um, I want to dive right into your book because it, it also stems from your, you know, your just decades of research on the most elite athletes in the world, you know. So so when you and I spoke prior to this interview, you mentioned that you, you talk about in your book that elite elite athletes just see the world differently, you know. So where do some of those differences lie when it comes to being an elite athlete, in your opinion? Well, it, it, again, it's, uh, it's kind of a total mind-body dimension here. Mm-hmm. And what I've learned over the years that uh, – the superior athletes that, you know, and perhaps I could explain that in the Playmaker's Advantage, why we came up with that name. My co-author, Dan Peterson, and I, uh, kind of everybody knows what a playmaker is. Mm -hmm. They're the difference makers and they make everybody around them better. And what is their advantage? Well, in all the years of researching this is that the one thing, just because we couldn't measure it, it's primarily it. Yeah. Nobody really understood that these, these people just, from a perceptual standpoint, that they saw the ice, the, the, the pitch, you know, the playing field, the court, just differently. Mm-hmm. They're red plays. Uh, they search for cues that the average player didn't do. And, and so they had that in, in, in incredible ability to do that. And, uh, you know, I was just looking at my desk here and way back in 2006. There was Wired magazine. Right here. It's still out there. Uh, and there was an article uh, written by Jennifer Kahn said, Wayne Gretzky style field sets may be teachable. Mm. And you know, think about that. Was not, that was two, 2000, it was in May of 2007 when that was written. And, you know, Wayne Gretzky was kind of viewed at that time and certainly even today as that somebody who saw the ice so differently yeah. than everybody else. And and then, then we got into a discussion. Well, he was born with that stuff and I love Gretzky's quote in the book. It says, no, uh, it, was, it, was, it was taught by Wally, his dad, yeah. in the backyard rink, you know, how to make decisions on the ice. But So it's that searching for cues that, that, that these great players have, the superstars, the playmakers. Uh, and then when it comes to decision-making, the, the, they, they have automated through practice, through deliberate practice, the ability to make quick and accurate decisions. They as you talked about one of your previous webcasts, the podcast, the the whole idea of recognizing patterns. They have mm-hmm. a memory for events, which is incredible. You see patterns uh, emerging, and uh, they identify them. Uh, they look for cues, uh, important cues that, that give away what, what a player might be doing, their opponent might be doing, or a goaltender might be giving away. Mm-hmm. And and then they make that quick decision, 
and then they execute the third part. Uh, so it's searching for cues, deciding, uh, and then they execute. Mm -hmm. uh, we emphasize th those three components in part two of the book. Uh, and then, you know, they don't mess up on that execution part, typically, you know. Mm -hmm. they, uh, there's kind of flawless execution because they've practiced and practiced and rehearsed it yeah. so much. And that's kind of how we try to present that information. Yeah, yeah. So these elite athletes, right, I love how you say cues, mechanisms, because I think people don't realize, like, at the next level, things just happen so quick that, if you if you sort of get yourself into too much of that thinking game, if you don't sort of pre-program those mechanisms and, you know, I, I, the way I look at my brain is, is sort of like a machine. It's it's like a, it can be it's program it's pro programmable, right? Like on the physical side and on the emotional and mental side, we can program different routines into our system, right? That allow us to to flawlessly and effortlessly execute. And I think that's you know where elite athletes sort of thrive right that execution is just it's so flawlessly mindfulness like it's it's just they're not even thinking about it because they've they practice it through repetition so much um and is that truly where it is you know like so people wonder right and you say Wayne Gretzky was sort of trained right like and he learned from his dad so the people that don't believe in that, can that truly be trained into those cues and all those things? Can we reprogram ourselves to do those things just effortlessly? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's been my argument for years uh, that this is an area we haven't focused on. And coaches are totally aware of that. In my last couple of years, when after my book came out, that said, can you tell us more? Yeah. And yeah. We've as coaches have ignored the training, the training of that because it was hard to measure those perceptual cognitive abilities. Now we can start measuring those attributes. And then, yes, it can be trained. So some of the, I've talked to almost all the great coaches in the world in, in the major sports. And, and yeah, let's, let's, can we collaborate more on how we could structure uh, drills, uh, that, that, you know, the physical drill, the technical drills that integrate the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think one of my contribution will be to engage coaches and starting to think that way how can we structure uh drills on the ice on the court on the field uh so that it it, it is a true more mind body decision making process stuff and it all becomes automated so because you, you can't you're right you can't get into the thinking part while you're working at a very rapid pace mm -hmm. so that's kind of my mission uh, the rest of my this is the last chapter of my career mike yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I am a, I'm a big fan of your work. Um, I think it's undervalued. Um, and obviously in in the elite uh, realm, it's um, it's something big. And I think that a lot of amateurs need to take note of this stuff. Um, but in your book, you detail, and obviously we just sort of talked about it that there's no such thing as as innate talent. We're not born with it. So. You know, based on your research, why why do you believe that? Based on all the work you did. Well, this goes back a long time to uh, my, I think I told you I wanted to be a, a coach because I was always fascinated by that question. Who are these great athletes? Why, why wasn't I one of them? <laughs> I had the same problem, same problem yeah, you had. No but, kidding. You know, five foot eight, and I wanted to be a major league baseball pitcher. Well, yeah, they weren't looking for five, yeah, eight, five yeah. foot eight guys or, or for that matter, hockey players or whether you, as a forward. Uh, you know, there weren't many. Dave Keon and others were right. about that size. That's about it. You know, Henry Richard. But but you had to be truly exceptional. So uh, I, I realized that that that, that you know that uh, you you certain I begin to thinking that it can't be that you're you're born with it. And then I just kept reading and reading, and, and other people have been searching for that uh, genetic dimension. Uh, and my good friend, we became good friends after he wrote his book, The Sports Gene. Your audience, if they haven't met it, they should. Mm -hmm. David Epstein wrote this book called The Sports Gene, where he basically uh, threw out that, that whole notion that, that people have been searching for the sports gene, that, that there'll be a gene for athletic ability. It doesn't exist, but people are still searching for the darn stuff. Yeah. You know, it all comes down to, to that, what... Uh, uh, many people have described it in different ways, but the notion of deliberate practice. Yes. Anders Ericsson at Florida State kind of championed all that, and and then many authors uh, really capitalized on that that idea. And 
now coaches believe that it's it's kind of how you practice and still uh it's just not uh, too many young athletes kind of just go to practice but they're not each and every day trying uh to improve on some subset of all their skills mm. so that they're totally masters of it yeah. and it comes automatically yeah. they just go through the routines of doing stuff and that's not good enough uh it has to be a truly deliberate practice and total engagement. And it may not always be a lot of fun, but that's the only way you're going to get to the top. Yeah. So we try to kind of really highlight that in, in the book and kind of the misunderstandings that are out there, particularly amongst parents of how, how one becomes a, a playmaker. Yeah. So we try to uh, throw in the science, what we've learned from many studies. And what I wanted to mention, uh, as you asked about kind of that early history too, David Hemry uh, was one of my students at Boston University. When I first got there, uh, he was a track athlete. Went, uh, he came, he immigrated from, from the UK. Uh, was a, a great, became a great hurdler at the university, and and uh, went on. He didn't think he could make the American team, so he could, uh, tried out for the British team and made the '68 Olympic team in Mexico City. And he, nobody knew him, but he trained so deliberately and started using mental rehearsal unlike anything had been reported before mm-hmm. and wins not only wins the gold medal sets a world record yeah uh he came back to boston uh, went to the 72 olympics we became good friends after i got there uh he came on to study to do his doctoral work with me and he had the same question i had as a youngster uh, of who are these great athletes but give, being he was a two-time olympic champion he had access to some of the great athletes in every sport all over the world. So he interviewed the, the very best, kind of their Hall of Famers now mm-hmm. in every conceivable sport, to find out what got them there. And it was clear that none of it had anything to do with genetics. Right. <laughs> Many times their parents were never even played a sport, weren't even fans of sport, although they supported their kids right. uh, in all cases. So that that uh, became a book, and uh, his dissertation and a book, uh, David Henry, uh, you may want to check that out. He's and, and still now he lives in the UK now, but uh, uh, D- David uh, kind of taught us a lot. And what's interesting is about four or five years ago, uh, the British Olympic Committee uh, wanted to plunge into this to dis- from using only you know uh, athletes from the UK. Is who were the great champions and how did they get there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I read that report, Mike, and it was no different than David's dissertation published in 1986. <laughs> so, so he had it right. Right, right, right. So this idea of, and, and you didn't mention this word, but, and I was, I was going to mention to you, uh, obviously you're familiar with, um, you know, deliberate practice and Erickson's work, but the idea of self-awareness. And, I, and, and if you could touch on that just a little bit, because elite athletes just have that next level of self-awareness. They're just so in tune with their body so in tune with their mind, every little thing that goes through their mind, every little feeling their body has. And and maybe you could just touch on a bit of that self-awareness and, and a bit of deliberate practice and what that means, because obviously those those were the biggest takeaways in terms of, um, and obviously you mentioned mental rehearsal as well. But how can people work on that self-awareness? How can people strive to deliberately practice every single day to achieve what these elite athletes have? I think it's important that they, first of all, become aware, recognize the importance of this self-awareness, kind of what they're thinking about, what their emotions are like, tune into those. Uh, If they tend to be individuals that get uh, anxious, uh, excited about certain events and have trouble self-regulating it, learn self-regulation skills uh, using heart rate variability techniques. That could all be learned today. We have technology to help you do that. Apps on your phone, and tablets. So, so yeah, that's important. But I, I don't think we we emphasize enough. Try to in, in explain to athletes what is this deliberate practice. Yeah, and and I think coaches haven't fully understood it. Also, the more you know, enlightened coaches read how to get better as coaches and they're getting all this information and what they were really lacking is this specificity the little things that yeah. go into a training program that you just described and yes the, the you know the Sidney Crosby's the world 
<laughs> they have pens- pay attention to the detail, yeah. the small detail, or, or or Steph Curry. You know, they 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 know this is important, and then to get better, they've got to keep ratcheting things up, mastering those skills, make sure they're mastered. And there's new stuff they want to learn. They're going to practice those, practice those, and get better. Yeah, no, I uh, I actually stumbled on. Um... Erickson's book back in college in 2014 and I I had already sort of been in tune with my body pretty well and deliberate and I think something that people need to talk about is sort of embracing that process right like working on those things those feelings because as goalies we go on the ice we go practice and we're facing you know hundreds of shots and practice and we're just sort of out there to stop the puck but I think a lot of goalies need to take a step back right and say you know what it's not Today, it's not necessarily just about stopping the puck. It's about reprogramming those sequences in your mechanical structure, right? And your mental structure, like your triggers, right? essentially. And really boiling those things down in terms of, okay, in a row, when I do a T-push or a butterfly slide, it just seems like it all just goes. But if we sort of find areas where we're lacking, we can reprogram the brain to react differently under that pressure. If we embrace that process, if 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 we give it time and we deliberately practice, because I think everybody wants that instant gratification. And when we're talking about these ideas, they're not things that happen overnight, you know, and, and maybe you can touch on that a bit. How, like, how long does it take to really develop these kind of things into uh, into elite status? Well, well, I guess I wanted to mention earlier, too, that, you know, it's, it's not we it wasn't purposely attended that in the book that we didn't include goaltenders as being playmakers, but there's a whole history of National Hockey League goaltenders truly being playmakers. They were difference makers. Mm-hmm. You know, you go back to you know uh, the early days, but then the great Oiler teams of Grant Fuhrer and and then that Patrick Waugh after, and then we've got some brilliant ones today that they 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 can change the outcomes of games. They're consistently brilliant, but they it doesn't come you know it, it's not not something they were born with, as, as we said earlier, yeah. that they work hard in practice and each and every practice and working with good goalie coaches to to master those little things so they become automated and the game is just in flow mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, my emphasis. Yeah, yeah, no. And I like that you said the word flow there. You know, I think we spend a lot of time talking about the physical side of the game, but the mental side of the game is just such an enormous part of elite athletics. It's how smaller guys like myself have been able to like do well and, and thrive and have a career because I think a lot of people don't put enough emphasis on that mental side of the game. So in your opinion, what are some of those key mental characteristics of, of elite athletes that you're, you're not really seeing in amateurs? Well, the ability to, to focus, mm-hmm. uh, and not get distracted from the, the things in, in that moment. Mm-hmm. They have that incredible skill to, to attend to what's important. And the other factor in, in related to concentration and attention is their ability to shift their attention from that very intense focus to kind of a more broad one that Bob Dynafer has constantly talked about for 40 years. Uh, the, the, from a, kind of a, a narrow focus to a broad focus mm-hmm. and have that flexibility to come from that broad focus, see the whole ice, see what's going on. That's a goaltender. There's a forward. You see, you're seeing the whole whole ice. And then you zero in on what you have to do. And it's to be able to switch that, 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 that attention flexibility. It's a huge asset. Yeah. Not everybody can do that, but that can be trained also, but it has to be practiced. Mm-hmm. So I think that may in fact be the single biggest factor the other one related to it is more on the emotional side and and that is that they, they can keep can kind of keep a uh, steady state that they're kind of in that yeah equilibrium in that, in that, yeah they're not in that zone which is in the inverted u kind of right in, in the middle so they're not they're not under aroused and they're not over aroused yeah. they just have that right amount of arousal have that nice steady heart rate they're calm and cool and collected and and don't get you know flustered so if you're a goaltender and you know guys are shoving you and yeah. uh, hacking away at you it's easy to easy to lose your your composure it's that the uh, ones don't it's that black mamba mentality that kobe Bryant mentality you can't get shook yes yes mm-hmm. so 
Yeah, there's a couple that I that I mentioned. I think are fairly important and dimensions of elite performance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, I um, I think the biggest thing for me when I was really young was I was actually pretty in tune around my draft year uh, in the OHL and Major Junior, just because I'm from Ontario. I was noticing that I I would like look in the stands or I'd look at scouts or I'd look at the shot clock or the time and I noticed that those things were distracting me and I think that for a lot of people knowing your triggers right knowing the things that that sort of distract you and take in, and take you away from your game that's a part of the elite aspect right like we all want to stay focused as much as possible but we all sort of have those triggers that um that sort of set us over right so you know, you talk about that switch, right? That mental shift, being able to harden and soft focus kind of thing. How can people work on that? You know, how can people build that? Um, and I know it, it was something that I sort of had too from a young age. I don't know what it was. I just had this switch where it was like I could laugh and be fine. And then I could and then I could get right back into it. And I wasn't thinking of like anything outside the glass. So um, over your years, like working with athletes, you know, how, how can we work on that switch? Well, Bob Nidefer, if your audience hasn't heard of him, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that book's still in, in, in press, uh, called Attention Control Training, where he gets into this uh, idea of how to train yourself to be able to focus intensely uh, and, then, and then shift your attention to more broad, uh, bro- uh, kind of a broad mm-hmm. attentional focus and go back and forth, but you gave great examples of things that kind of distract particularly young players, and they have to be aware yeah. of that. You know, paying attention to the wrong, things that aren't important. Yes. <laughs> you know, looking into the stance, are the scouts there, or whatever, mm. or, you know, <clears throat> who might be there. You got to focus on, on doing your job, right? That's the biggest way I put it when I talk about it is exactly. elite athletes know that, even though there's millions of dollars on the line for a game, they're not thinking of the end result of the game. They're not thinking of if they falter before the game. And you mentioned it being in that moment. Right. And I think it's for a lot of people, it's sort of hard, you know, and I don't think they really understand that, that phrase. So maybe you can just touch a bit on how people can work on being in that moment more. Yeah. And that, that's the concept itself, staying in the moment, you know, and, and what's really become popular in the general sports psych field uh, they refer to today as mindfulness. And I chuckle because it's another term that, that that has been introduced and everybody's jumped on it yeah. to want to teach mindfulness training so athletes can stay in the moment. Yeah. But 45 years ago, I was doing the same darn thing. We just didn't call it mindfulness. <laughs> it was it was a focus on your breathing and breath is still today the most important part and is an important part of mindfulness training uh, and, and, and the engagement of imagery. You're right. Uh, and so we were teaching those concepts. Uh, we call it imagery training, to be able to rehearse kind of what you're doing and see the perfect form or maybe rehearsing your, your role model who you're going to learn from. Uh, and in the book, we write about how David Hemry did that in preparation for the 68 Olympics in Mexico City. But it was a great imagery example. We, that's what we called it. But it's staying and then staying in the moment and bringing yourself there and and. I can't emphasize enough the importance of of learning to breathe properly to kind of center mm-hmm. yourself. And Nidifer talks a lot about that in attention control training, the notion of, of centering. It's around breathing and uh, keeping composed and staying in the moment, moment reminding yourself, not being distracted. Mm-hmm. And the great beauty today, and I'll keep mentioning because I'm a big fan of using technology to improve performance, and there, there are wonderful apps uh, that that teach athletes how to breathe properly, uh, engage, engage in imagery as well, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and you know now we refer to it as heart rate variability training. Right. And there's some wonderful apps for doing that as well. But th- that that's to kind of help athletes stay in the moment. That's what yeah. you're trying to. Yeah, do. yeah. Are there any examples of maybe some things you could recommend to my audience in terms of where they can go to? Yeah, there's a, there's a, a company that uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it's consumer grade, but it's also pro teams like the Penguins use it. It's called Elite HRV, yeah. Elite Elite HRV, and all you need is a heart monitoring system, like a polar system, or they have a little device you just put on your finger and monitor your heart rate variability every day, see how well you're recovered, but also to use it as a training device to teach you to, 
to stay calm and composed and in the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you you know, I, I always put a lot of emphasis on the mental side of the game, but in your opinion, maybe a rating one out of 10, you know, how much does that mental side of the game have an impact on your performance or how important is it? Well, it, 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 it's hard for me, Mike, to put a, a number on <laughs> one to ten because I'm I'm always I'm always a mind body yeah. guy, and and they move back and forth, and they're they go they're hand intertwined. In hand for sure. They go really go hand in hand, and if you're not thinking about how to train physiologically, and and and, and how if you're not tr thinking about how you're going to master this motor skill, or thinking about your sleep habits. Or thinking about your nutritional intake. Mm -hmm. If you're not thinking about that, you're not engaging the mind. So it's hard to really separate that out uh, and, and, give, and, and partition it. So it's kind of the, the full thing. It's a mind-body preparation to be the best in the world at what you want to do. Uh, so that's kind of what I try to impart to all the teams and individual athletes I work with. That, that uh, I'm not one of those people mm -hmm. uh, that, for example, I, I know of many sports science departments and pro sports around the world is that everybody in their little discipline, whether it's a strength and conditioning person or it's a skills coach or uh, the, the athletic trainer and, and the nutritionist, they think that their area is the most important thing to the team's success. They're, they're full of baloney. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not. You know, it's, it's the, the full package. Yeah. You've got to integrate this all in some systematic way. And that involves thinking about it. Mm -hmm. and so that's a big part of it. And so, uh, uh, yeah, it's hard to put a number on it, but it, it, it's huge, but in, in an integrated manner. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you're, you're telling us a bit about your, your work with the Canucks back in, in 2010, and you're explaining the idea of sports science and neuroscience and, and sports psychology to them. Maybe just explain to us, you know, how that all went down with, with getting them on board with these ideas. Were, were those ideas new to the NHL at the time, or was it something that had been popping up a little bit? Well, it was pretty new to the NHL, pretty new to most sports. Uh, and, yeah, they, 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 that uh, uh, you know, the, the veterans would look at kind of, uh, what the hell is this? You know? Right, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and uh, we had, you know, Elaine Vigneault was the head coach then, and, he was, you know, I'd still describe him as pretty old school. Uh, I, I think it had a little bit of an impact on him to try to, to kind of go beyond what he's seeing with his own eyes, that when you're trying to monitor an athlete's performance using technology, he wasn't a big fan of that kind of stuff. So, it, it, you know, but that's that, that's not how they were trained. Mm -hmm. They were using their eyes. And I tried to remind them that they, their eyes don't see everything. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was it was always a sell. And, and, and uh, I... I you know, the strength and conditioning people, the uh, uh, athletic trainers were kind of feeling, well, you know, this is, I'm, I'm into a routine. Uh, uh, Doc wants me to change some of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it, it was a constantly a hard sell. But remember, I was kind of the first guy doing this stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so that has changed, though, in the last decade. Absolutely. I, I talked to my colleagues around world who have gotten into heading up the sports science things and and yeah there, there's still often battles with the coaching staffs yeah. who are more old schoolish but uh, no there's whenever you try to bring in something new there's going to be you're, you're pushing a little boulder up a hill yep. and so uh, i experienced some of that but it was still a great learning experience trying to to influence people uh, and uh so now, uh, you know, that was pre-analytics too, Mike, you know, yeah, the, yeah. now analytics are huge in all sports. That's for so, sure. uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, uh, I figure everything's sort of, and I always say this, we, I bring on people, we talk about things that are sort of, uh, always met with resistance, but if, if the numbers and the data say that, that it helps, then you can't really argue it. Right. So what do you think these teams were really looking for, right? Like you said they were against it. Now there's this huge shift on the horizon that's already underway. Um, you know, what's that main puzzle piece that they're looking for that, you know, they see fitting into their training plans now that they didn't before? Well, they're all searching for the competitive advantage. They've, you know, we've exhausted everything in, 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 in right. think about it, in strength and conditioning work. We, we, we know that field inside out. 
the one that's always still elusive is the nutritional field. We're always finding new stuff every month. For sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, you know, how we maximize VO2 max, if that's important in hockey or not, mm -hmm. I'm not convinced. But uh, we've, we've really maxed out in all those traditional sports science areas. Uh, and the, the one we haven't, of course, is the psychology. And now we're getting to the analytics. Sometimes I think we're overanalyzing in some sports, particularly baseball. I think they, they can't try to capture everything. Uh, we were just talking about that the other day. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and gosh, uh, so the question is, so, so what, what is really important uh, in the analytics field? Now, we've got so much information. Very few people have the skill set to interpret any of that stuff. Right. Because they weren't trained to do that. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the, the statisticians, they have all that expertise, but they don't understand the sport. Mm -hmm. Sport people understand the sport, but they don't understand statistics. So uh, you need kind of a broker in there. And that's, Kind of what I took a lot of pride in is serving as a broker for some of that knowledge. Mm -hmm. But still, it comes down to what is really important. Yeah, that's impressive data. What the hell is it telling us? Yeah. How can we improve the performance of the athlete and the team? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. It's funny that you say that. I uh, In college, I, I minored in statistics and I took uh, some classes on data science and that sort of there's there's that there's the disconnect between the statisticians and the people that actually play the game because there's a lot of truth to the, to the numbers. Um, but you know when we get down to business, the numbers, you know, although we we like to rely on them a bit, I think that there's some gray areas still there. So um, and we're moving in the right direction, I think. Uh, you, you know, and and everything's and it's sort of a trial and error thing too. You know, like what stats uh, can we focus on that work? I swear, every year they're coming out with new stuff to sort of. Uh, evaluate everybody some things work some don't they make their way out type of thing you know what i mean so um anyways um you know you mentioned privately that you've been consulting with the pittsburgh penguins and the golden state warriors the last year you know what's it like interacting with with athletes from both those organizations are there things there that you notice that they have that that other organizations and players don't well they're very, very successful franchises yeah you know. for sure uh, and uh, they they were of course the warriors were decimated this year with injuries, but so were the penguins. But they, hockey's a different sport in, in in terms of that their people can can rise to the occasion. The younger players, it's a little more difficult than the NBA. Is if you can't shoot, you, yeah. you're not going to win. Yeah, and so uh, it's. Uh, uh, in in my case, I think I, I have to confess, you know, like. Uh, they know I've been around the block once or twice. Yeah. So I'm not one of those guys who's going to come to an organization and be in awe of a Steph Curry or or a uh, Sidney Crosby or uh, uh, Malkin and uh, Latang. You know, they, you know, we they, they, many of them had heard of me before. I'd met Sid when I was writing the book because he was a great interview for the book. So it's we have a different kind of relationship. I'm, you know. Uh, they just seem as you know other wonderful human beings and mm -hmm. and uh, great athletes, but uh, not in awe of them. And they see me the same way. They don't. They don't. I. Th I don't think they see me as this uh, ivory tower professor from yeah, yeah, Boston yeah. University. Yeah, <laughs> the guy's been in a few hockey rinks, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and basketball courts. So they appreciate that. So and so it's, it's a lot different, and I think more difficult for young people as they're getting into those elite organizations and something that just, you know, it's, it's, uh, you just walk in there like you're walking into your home, you know, and, uh, and try to help them out. Yeah. And, and you know, and you, you got to be genuine and they, they, they recognize immediately that yeah. that's what my role is, not just to hang around them. Yeah. I'm just curious over the years, who do you think is the most, and maybe you can give me two or three, but who is the most elite athlete you probably ever worked with, either mentally or physically or both, and why? Well, I, I you know, I can go back to my those early days uh, working with a guy like David Henry. You know, when you're two two time Olympic champion, and then after he retired, uh, went into kind of super athlete competitions in the UK and, and won those things. Right, just an incredible human uh, athlete, and, and and I think track and field is kind of the ultimate darn sport which has really informed so much of our training methods in other sports. Really? Uh, 
But then I, I think back of some of my early work with a, uh, a hockey player like Jerome McGinley when I was working with Calgary. You know, he was kind of at that time in a league of his own. Uh, yep. You know, I uh, Gretzky had, had, had long retired. Uh, but Gretzky was one of the guys who was interviewed by Emery for his book way back when. There's wonderful stories. And, and I tried to get him for the book, and I just kept missing him. Mm. Uh, not able to connect with the book. We had a short, limited period of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but to, when I worked with the Spanish uh, uh, national World Cup team back in 2006 and eight, and you know, uh, uh, Xavi and Iniesta were, you know, just world class performers with really sharp brains. Mm-hmm. They did stuff out on the pitch that, you know, here in North America, we soccer is not a big sport, as we often say, it's like watching grass grow. But you go, you go to that level of performance in the World Cup, and, and then you see these elite players come to the forefront. Those guys, they were impressive to work with. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, uh, you know, uh, when, when I was in Vancouver, Chris Danoff was a, uh, an up-and-coming young player, spent quite a bit of time with them, and he developed into a, a really good National Hockey League defenseman, mm-hmm. uh, and very skilled. And, and, uh, and of course, uh, Crosby, uh, who I've gotten to know the last few years, is, yeah, he's... Uh, I think arguably the best player in the National Hockey League today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and well, has been for some time. And of course, he's got guys breathing out his neck now, mm-hmm. <laughs> Connor and, and Drysdale and Edmonton. But there's other great players too, and so uh, that I haven't been around. But uh, yeah, they're 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 not only impressive uh, physically, t- tactically, technically. They're uh, they're all great people. You know, yeah, like yeah. You want them as the best friends. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, what do you think is probably the biggest thing? You say these guys are world class. What exactly makes them world class? I hear a lot of people say that, you know, but maybe break it down a little bit for for our listeners, if you, if you can. Well, I, I think it's that ability to to perform on demand under pressure, and and almost always they're under pressure. Yeah. If it's a you're playing the last place team in the league, or you're it's a game seven on the Stanley Cup in hockey. Uh, there, there, there's pressure there, and uh, the, what the great ones do is they don't succumb to that pressure. And I, I, you know, I don't like to use that word that's thrown around in sports so much. They choke on people. Choke. It's not always <laughs> choking. <laughs> You'll see that in, in individual sports more often, where you're in total control of the. Of, of what you're doing, like for example, a golfer, mm-hmm. you know, and and uh, uh, all you've got to do is get par on this on the 18th hole, and uh, you know you, you get a triple bogey, you know, and so you had total control over it, but you you got these crazy thoughts and and weren't focused on what you had to do, uh, and, and 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 so your routines got you started thinking about stuff, and um, you totally underperformed. Mm-hmm. And what the great players do, and, and in team sports, uh, uh, you'll see, see that often, that, that, that they just don't fold in these pressure-packed games. Right, they never break. I remember, yeah, thinking, I think back to uh, Chris Drury, who worked with the Boston U, and a little few people know that he was a, pitched the final game of the Little League World Series years ago in, in Trumbull, Connecticut. And won that game as, as a pitcher, and we I often talked about that when he was at BU, and then he was a small guy like you and yeah, I. Yeah, yeah, he was. But the Avalanche take him, and they said, "Oh, you'll never make it." Well, yeah, Chris did quite all right. Now he's the assistant GM of the Rangers. He had yeah. a hell of a career, and uh, but but we often talk to Chris about that in the big games where he always performed well at BU and in the National Hockey League. And he says, "Doc, I don't understand what what they're saying about you know the." The pressure. He says, "I don't. I just see it as an opportunity." Yeah, and I love that. And see, not many people can see that opportunity. You know, mm-hmm. and they're going to seize it. Uh, they, you know, they they they're, they get into that negative spiral of thinking about you know what ifs. Yes. You know? So it's it, so to that's the big separator, I think, Mike, yeah. of, of the, the champion performers, the playmakers, is that in these pressure situations, you know, they're still. Uh, reading plays better than anybody else. Yeah. They're making quicker, better decisions, and then they're executing flawlessly. Yeah, yeah. No, I think maybe the best word to to describe what you just said is perspective. 
right? Uh, right. These guys just have a completely different perspective on the situation. You know, you could turn it any way you want. And that's sort of when I was young, that's how I turned it. I was like, you know what? I'm not on a great team or whatever it is. This is a big opportunity for me to shine. They see these pressure, pressure situations as opportunities rather than getting scared of it and thinking about the end results or maybe anything that happened before, right? They're truly in that moment, embracing that process, embracing that opportunity. Um, exactly, exactly. Um, I love that. I love that you just said that. So, you know, you had mentioned to me that you spent a day with Sidney Crosby and Mike Sullivan. Obviously, you've been working with them for a while now, but why don't you just sort of take us through your first impressions of them too and, and how your experience was with them? Well, Mike, I've known for a long time, when he, way back when he was captain of the BU Terriers, and, and, and uh, I worked with him a lot and then followed his career and, and playing and coaching. And, and uh, when I told him the ideas of the book, actually, I heard him, he was between jobs and he was giving a, a talk to, to coaches and, and he got into neuroscience. I said, God, where did Mike learn that stuff? He didn't do, learn that at BU. <laughs> but he, he, the coaches had better understand the brain and how people learn and how you teach them. Right. And and impressed me. So I called Mike. I said, Mike, I'm writing a book on this stuff. Uh, he got all excited about it. He says, how can I help? I, so uh, I, I spent time. I interviewed him during the off season at home in Boston area. And, and then uh, he liked what he was doing. And I said, can, how can I help you more? I said, well, Mike, would you? And Dan Peterson and I, and I introduced Dan to, to Mike and said, that, let's. Mike, could you write the forward to the book? And he did. And he did a beautiful job. Anybody who reads nice. that, you'll see uh, philosophy. And it's that way today. And uh, and then one of the things Mike said, well, you're writing about a playmaker, uh, Doc. You, you, why don't you come to training camp and spend a better part of the day with, with Crosby? I'll hook it up and make sure you – I'll just lock you guys in my in my office. <laughs> and, it, and that's what we did. Right on. And he was – he was so cordial and uh, answered a lot of questions, and uh, we integrated him into the book as much as I could. So, you know, I couldn't have gotten a better play at that time to kind of talk about being a playmaker and kind of how he approaches the game. Yeah, and it's good to see him. You know, you know, this year when I'm working with him to to engage and I like his sense of humor. He likes mine. So yeah, he seems like yeah, a pretty lighthearted guy. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Uh, what do you think is the biggest thing that, that stuck out to you in your, your time with him, your short time with him there? You spent that day with him. What was the one, maybe two things that you could just see uh, that really stood out to you? Well, it's the humility. and uh, and uh, I love that word. Of, I love that you just said and, that. And it's, it's just, there's just not a, not a bit of arrogance anywhere. You know? yeah. We're like, what a stupid question that is. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, how to follow up to make sure he read the interview and agreed that, that I didn't misquote him or anything. And so it's just staying in contact with them. So it's a humility that you don't always see with all uh, superstars in all sports. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting hockey for some reason, and maybe I'm just closer to it, but the, you know, they've got the best people in, in the world of pro sports, in my opinion, yeah. um, just as, as uh, decent human beings, which, you know, the whole character dimension is something I, I really value. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, that, this, <coughs> that was a very rewarding experience and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to spend that kind of time with him. Yeah. What do you think, you know, I, I love that you said humility. I love it because I preach humility. I preach character a lot and I think people don't realize how important it is. So maybe, maybe for you, maybe, that's the one thing that stuck out to you, but why do you think that's so important in order to, to exercise humility, to become elite? Um, that's a good question. I, you know, it's, uh, I, I think it's part of your total overall upbringing, you know, yeah. nothing came, came easy and it worked for every darn thing that you got. And, uh, you're always grateful. You know, this wasn't, uh, something that was handed to you. Right. And uh, so you want to give some of that back and and be nice to people. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard, you know, for a guy like a Crosby or any superstar. <coughs> you go on these road trips or just people just dogging you. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. 
Yeah, and in and in European soccer, that I had a couple of years of experiencing that, it's even more challenging there, where the fans are just so rabid with the elite yeah, soccer players. For sure. Yeah. So. No, um, <laughs> I like it. The way I think of humility is that. In sports, like we're never going to be perfect. You know, it's just it's it's impossible. I think we can be perfect some nights, but we can't be all the time. And I think elite athletes always know that no matter where they stand and no matter how good they are, there's always a little bit room to get better. And especially at that NHL level, those major league levels, there's not a huge marginal difference when it comes to winning and losing and all the players around it. It's, it's a couple quarter seconds. It's a couple quarter inches. And, and I think the way I see it is that those elite athletes just understand that there's always a 10th of an inch more that they can get. There's always that 10th of a second more that, that they can sort of go after that'll help them give the, that'll help give them an edge on the field. So if you don't have that humility, if you think that you are the best and that you're good where you are, then you'll never grow as a player, even when you get to the NHL level, you know, oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in recent memory, there's been a, a big rise in, in neurovisual training products. Do you see this as a fad or, or is this stuff uh, legit? You know, is that sort of that next edge that, that people can get on the playing field? No, I don't think it's a fad. I think it's going to go away. I think we're going to get better using technology. And I'm glad you brought that up. I think you mentioned that I was probably the first person in North America to use the, the neuro tracker. It was mm-hmm. developed in by Jocelyn Foubert, the University of Montreal. So I used it with the Canucks, and I said, you know, there was some. They they looked at it with skepticism, and I said, you know, this is just even if you just used it pre-game just to prep the brain for competition. Yeah. Because uh, what you're doing is a multiple object tracking. Engage in it, and again, because it was so new, with the first, and well, who else is using this stuff? Well, maybe nobody, but we're going to be the first. And yeah, now it's got a lot of traction. Yes. It's used in many other disciplines besides the world of of, of sport. And uh, and I'm still on their science advisory board. Uh, the uh, I think I told you at the outset that I'm involved with sub, several startups. Do we? Uh, a couple of my colleagues and I developed a, a, a pitch recognition. Uh, yeah, uh, you didn't mention app, that. And, and 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 that's you know getting a lot of traction and kind of the perfect thing to use during this these silly crazy. Uh, virus days where everybody mm-hmm. is inactive but baseball players can just purchase that app and and train pitch recognition they can do that yeah. in the comfort of their home uh so uh, and we're hoping to take that that whole concept of, of visual occlusion using real live video uh on apps that can be on your tablet or your iphone and and, and train young athletes uh so that's one of my goals too to use technology to train perceptual cognitive skills. Uh, and then um, more recently, I got involved with a, a new company out of, out of Prague, Czechoslovakia, in Czech Republic, where they developed a VR system for training hockey mm-hmm. players, mm-hmm. not only the physical skills themselves, but the perceptual cognitive one, the decision-making mm-hmm. skills that I've been emphasizing. And again, I'm serving as an advisor for them too. That's the first thing I've ever seen in the world of hockey designed to 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 train hockey players off ice yeah and we have a commercial version and now they've moved into kind of a having a, a version uh, for homes yeah so but it's brand new it's just out uh, i think in the uh in the toronto area there's they've, they've got an office there got one in the boston area and of course in in, in prague but they're brand new i think this is going to be a kind of a new event dimension that some of you listeners may want to want to take a take a look at the company's mm-hmm. called uh, sense arena s-e-n-s-e arena mm-hmm. uh and i think you know in the next couple of years it's going to get a lot of traction and be a wonderful training device to not only help young athletes master the the mechanical and technical skills of, yeah. of the sport but the decision making as well yeah no i've seen it around a little bit um and i know that neuro tracker down the road they'll be developing a, a vr system as well from from what absolutely I've yeah, yeah yeah so things yeah. are going to just keep getting get better and better we get more expertise uh, uh, based on good, good cognitive neuroscience and, and the technology just some brilliant people doing there in the, particularly in the gaming industry yeah yeah no but i think the point i want to make here is that that young athletes it, it, got to understand that this is part of that deliberate practice yeah it, it's it, it's it's not uh, entertainment you know, no, you're not for sure you're not playing 
Fortnite. This is a this is a game. We try to gamify it so that it's entertaining, but but more importantly, it, it's educating. Yeah. And and so it's training, uh, which is the most important part. And that's a little bit of an example of this deliberate practice we talked about earlier. Yeah. No, in terms of the neuro the neurovisual training stuff, I was fortunate enough to sort of stumble on this stuff uh, like six seven years ago. Yes. And uh, it's something I've used to my advantage. I haven't really been sharing it with everybody. <laughs> Because, you know, for me, yeah, yeah, it is, you know, but we're sort of at that point where the the cat's out of the bag and, um, you know, it's very well known that that at every elite level and every elite sport athletes are doing this type of training, you know. Um, So for everybody listening, uh, you know, I I, I hit me up directly, you know, to to get started with the neural tracker if it's something you're interested in, because it's uh, Dr. Zykowski was is involved with the company in the process. And um, in my opinion, the way the, where the game is heading and I and I saw this a while ago, you know, it's just getting so fast. Right. And so how can we get those those quarter seconds back, those half seconds back that, you know, make that decision making process more accurate. Right. That execution that we talked about and the way I see that all this software coming up. Uh, that's exactly how we can deliberately train those things without guessing in, in terms of whether it's effective or not. Right. So um, obviously that's sort of the direction we're going with that. What what drew you initially into the software? And and you you obviously still think that stuff's affected to this day, if not more, more emphasis on it now than more now than ever. Well, you, you can't beat them, join them. That's kind of my, my take on it. But I've always <laughs> been... I've always been into technology and it, yeah. uh, my career really got jump started in the academic world using biofeedback to teach whether, whether it was athletes or uh, a high performance in any field to learn how to self-regulate using uh, different modalities and biofeedback. Mm-hmm. So that was all technology based and I published a lot of articles along those lines. So I always had a tech orientation And uh, you mentioned uh, kind of doing research, and I taught stat and research at Boston U for the whole time I was there. So I'm pretty well versed in the in the whole area of of analytics, Mm -hmm. and so it became kind of a natural. And but you know, who would have thought this uh, when I first started training to be to get into this field that understanding statistics was going to be important and cognitive neuroscience was going to be important? But that's where the world is today. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, and I think that the game has become more competitive than ever. And it's it's only going to get more competitive. It's only going to continue to grow. And uh, I think that th- these are these this is a way that you can sort of get ahead and, and get that next edge. So, um, Doc, do you have any last words of advice for everyone listening um, that you feel passionate about? No, you did a great job of asking a whole series of questions, much of what we've covered in the book. But gosh, if you want to learn more more detail about it yeah pick up the book you can you can get it at uh, <laughs> through, through amazon of course yep. we'll put uh, it in the we'll put it in the show notes for all the books that doc mentioned uh throughout the show we're gonna we're gonna put all of those in the show notes so head over there after if you guys want to pick those up well, you went you went through all of those things and then some of them are recent work where we get into the kind of using technology like hrv and and uh visual occlusion and yeah. uh uh, uh other kinds of video technologies. So, uh, you know, uh, you've kind of gone the gamut, but again, if you want to follow up d- down the line in the future, I'd be glad, I'd be glad to help you out. Uh, keep, keep sharing information with your audience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Doc. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, you know, I, I've been looking for somebody with, with sort of uh, something similar to your resume and you, and you totally blow it out of the park of the kind of guy that I wanted to have on. So, you know, it's really, it's been really cool just breaking all these ideas down and, and putting some holes in the, the traditional thinking. I know everyone's going to love this. So just an incredible inside look into some of the most elite minds in the athletic space in the entire world. So can you just let my audience, you know, know uh, the name of your book, uh, where they can find it and, and how to find you online? Yeah, it, it, it's it's kind of it, the book is called The Playmaker's Advantage: um, How to Raise Your Mental Game to the Next Level. By the way, it was published. You know, the guy who uh, who agreed to publish it for me it was uh, Derek Jeter, the great Yankee shortstop. Oh, really? Who, uh, who, yeah, he after retired, he became 
part of the Simon and Schuster Enterprise, a large publishing company in New mm. York. And so they, they, I've got his autograph, but he paid for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Unreal, so, man. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's kind of uh, where, where you can you can get that, and uh, you'll see our website with Dan, my my partner, co-author Dan Peterson, eighty uh, percent um, mental dot com. But uh, your readers, they want to, uh, or listeners, I should say, uh, can send me an email. That's easy to remember. It's, yep. it's sport s p o r t at b u dot edu. You know, I'm not going to lose lose that that email address. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if they have questions, we can follow up. Yeah. Right on. So go check out, go check out Dr. Leonard Zykowski. All the links will be available in the show notes for you guys to head over after. Doc is one of the most established individuals in the entire athletic science world. If you haven't seen his book yet, go check it out. The Playmaker's Advantage. He's literally fathered sports science and been a leading influencer in the area for decades now and in the globe. So Maybe somewhere down the road, like you mentioned, we'll have you back on the show if, if that's something you're interested in, because I know you'll be continuing with your work and, and sports science is obviously constantly evolving, like you said. So, Thanks so much. I'd be glad to do that. And it just was, it was a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, well, I'm grateful for you coming on, Doc. You take care and, and be safe in these crazy times. We'll chat soon, man. Yeah, thank you. You too. Thanks for tuning in this week's episode, guys. If you liked what you heard today, make sure to hit that subscribe button as we have tons of amazing guests lined up already to come onto the show the next few months. Make sure to tune in next week and every Tuesday from now on at 8 a.m. as we have NHL goalie coach Andrew Allen, the Buffalo Sabres goalie coach for four of the last five years and is now working with Seattle as they build their organization from the ground up. We talk about his ECHL championship his eight-plus year career coaching in the NHL, and what separates National League goaltenders from average shows. I'm really excited for you guys to hear this one. You won't be disappointed, so make sure to tune back next week. Without further ado, here are the giveaway details for the NeuroTracker X subscriptions we're giving away. To enter the giveaway, simply go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Once you leave a review of the podcast, take a screenshot of it and either email it to goaliehacks at gmail.com or DM me on Instagram with your screenshot and your full name. If you guys are also interested in getting started with the product, they are currently offering subscriptions for cheaper than what the price will be when the product fully launches. So if you guys want to get started at a cheaper price before the product goes fully live, hit me up on Instagram. Get excited, guys. Great things ahead. I hope you enjoyed today's show, and I'll see you next week.